All right, so in this video, I want to take a look at the stack trace and also how this can help with debugging. So to get started with this, the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is just conceptually what is the stack trace. And then I want to uh, create a very simple program where we're going to run it. We'll introduce some kind of error or exception inside of it and then be able to take a look at the, uh, how the stack trace actually looks uh, when we attempt to compile or run a program. So to start off with this conceptual discussion, we first uh, want to make sure that we understand exactly what a stack is and then more precisely what the stack trace is. So this idea of a stack, uh, you can think of it as essentially a structure of the data that is being stored in your program that is going to be in the form of what we refer to as a stack. Uh, it's going to be like a, um, you can think of it sort of like a stack of plates where we start off with some kind of data that we put at the very bottom of this stack. And then as we add something else to it, we'll place that on top of it. And then we'd have something else from there that goes on top of that. So typically, whenever you're going to be dealing with stacks, if you're talking about something like, say, uh, just general data structures and programming, uh, usually this is discussed in terms of uh, different pieces of data, uh, say like, uh, like items or variables, uh, kind of like when you're dealing with things like your arrays or your array lists. You could describe the individual items that you put into it in a very similar sort of fashion. But in this particular case, what I want to talk about is going to be the stack trace where rather than talking simply about uh, just individual data items like variables, instead what we're going to be talking about are going to be the different methods for our program. So this overall thing that we have right here is going to be our stack trace. And so the individual items, rather than being just simple variables, are actually going to be methods. So the very first one that we're going to have right inside of here is going to be the main method. So no matter what program you're running in Java, uh, in all cases, it doesn't matter. The main method is always going to be the entry point of your program. So it's always going to be the very first method that gets put onto this stack. So this is going to be sort of like our first plate is the main method. And then from there, the next thing that we're going to put onto this is going to be whatever method that we call inside of the main method. So let's say that somewhere inside of our main method, we're going to call some other method. And we'll just give it a pretty generic name. We'll say something like other method. And go ahead and place that there. And then maybe later, at some other point in time, inside of our other method, we're going to call yet another method. So going on top of that, place that here. And so we'll continue this process where every time one of these methods has to call some other method in our program, we're going to continually put them onto this stack. Uh, the way that we could describe that is we could say that we push them onto the stack. And then whenever we finish one of these, say like we've reached the end of one of these methods, so we're going to stop running it and we're going to terminate it or return from it, we will uh, do the opposite. So when we push items onto the stack, uh, the opposite of that would be to pop them off of the stack. So maybe we reach the end of another method, so we're basically going to remove that from the stack. So uh, let's say in the simplest case, we'll just kind of mark that out. So we kind of just remove that one from the stack. And then we carry on from other method. We finish that one, we'll pop that off the stack. Remove that there. And then we'll continue on with this process of pushing and popping methods uh, with the main method always staying in the stack for as long as the program is running until eventually we might reach the end of the program. So when the program is completely finished and terminates, that's when the main method is completed. And then that also gets popped off of the stack. Okay. And so the useful thing about the stack trace is that because we're constantly keeping track of the methods that we push onto or pop off of our stack, we can uh, consistently keep track of where in our program we currently are in the case that some kind of error occurs. So as soon as an error occurs somewhere in our program, or like say an exception is thrown, we can immediately identify what line that occurred on because that's basically the last point that we were at in the program just before that exception occurred. So if we come over to our programs, uh, we'll go ahead and create, say, a new program or a new project. Uh, for this one, I'm going to go ahead and call this something like the uh, stack trace demo. So we'll be using this as a way to demonstrate the behavior of our stack trace. 
for this one, uh, just like all of our Java programs, as I mentioned with this description here, obviously we need a main method. So we have our public static void main. We have that string array of arguments. Uh, inside of here, what I want to go ahead and do is something very simple. I just want to call another method inside of this. So just a uh, start off with just kind of a single line of code, and then we'll kind of build on that from there. So the other one that I'm going to go ahead and call, I'm going to use the same naming conventions I used here so that our implementation kind of goes hand in hand with this conceptual descript, uh, description. So we'll do public static void other method. For now, this is not going to take any arguments. And what we're going to go ahead and do here is just have a simple print statement just to let us know where we're currently at. So we'll just say this is the other method. And so then instead of our main method, we just want to go ahead and call this. So we'll just go ahead and save it. We'll just go ahead and compile this and run it. The simple expectation is that we're going to go into the main method. We'll call other method. We'll come into here and do and uh, execute this, uh, this print statement. So coming over to here, go ahead and compile this. We'll have our stack trace demo. And go ahead and run that. Okay, so we can see our single print statement. This is the other method. So now what I want to go ahead and do is add a couple more lines of code to this. And what I'm going to do is, uh, for this particular example, I'm going to set up an instance of our scanner class so that we can get some keyboard input. And I want to use a particular method of our uh, scanner class. Uh, we'll use the next int method and set it up so that when I pass something into that method, uh, some user input, it will not be an integer, so it will cause an exception to be thrown. And then we'll take a look at the output in our console when that exception occurs. So we'll go ahead and import the scanner class from our util package. Make sure that we've got that. We can come into, uh, let's say that we just want to do everything from the other method. So inside of the other method, we're just going to make our single call from the main. And then we'll just go ahead and do everything here. So we'll go ahead and create our scanner object. Call this keyboard. It's equal to a new scanner. So we'll read from our standard input stream. So we'll have system.in. We can also go ahead and create some kind of uh, variable that's meant to hold the input from the user. So I'm going to use the next int method. So we'll go ahead and make sure that our variable is of type int. So this will be our user input. Let's go ahead and say this is equal to zero. Uh, we'll then go ahead and create a simple print statement asking the user for a number. So say please enter a number. And then right here, we'll go ahead and get that. So say uh, we'll take that number and we'll assign that to our user input. So we're going to say keyboard.nextInt. And then finally, if everything does actually work correctly, the very last thing we could do is just go ahead and print out that number. So for this one, we'll have a print line statement. We'll say the number entered was plus our user input. Okay. So we'll go ahead and compile and run this. We'll do this with two different cases. The first, we'll just do it with normal input just to see our typical program flow. And then we'll do it a second time, but we'll go ahead and give it some uh, faulty or erroneous user input and then see what happens there. So we'll go ahead and compile this. We'll run it. So we're now inside of our other method. We've constructed our keyboard object. We've got our variable for the user input. We're now at this line right here where it's asking us to enter a number. Uh, we're kind of just waiting for that next int. So for this one, we could just go ahead and do a simple number. So we'll do like say the number seven. And when we give it some value that it was actually expecting with that next int method, it will just go ahead and continue to execute the rest of the program as normal. But if we do this again, but say now instead of just putting the number seven, I try to type out the word seven. Now what we get is an exception thrown. And what's going to happen here is now it's gonna show us all of this different information. And this is actually going to be related to our stack trace. So there's gonna be a couple of other things that are added to the stack trace other than just these couple of methods that I mentioned here. And the reason for that is gonna be that whenever I make this call to next int, well, this is another method call that I have right here that needs to go off to wherever that method definition happens to be. That's going to be related to the scanner class itself, which is why you're going to see a lot of things right here. 
where it talks about scanner.java because if we think about the different classes that we're working with from our Java API, well, just like any of the custom classes that we might create for our own programs, for our own uh, spe uh, specific applications, uh, all of the classes that we use from the Java API also have their own Java files. So they all, they all have their own definitions as well. So in this case, we've got a couple of different things from our, uh, from our scanner class that it has to step through. So it's got a throw for and then a next method and then we've got these uh, different calls to the next int method. So we can kind of start to see where we're getting to the point where we're uh, talking about the method that we actually tried to call. So we can see that as being part of our stack trace. On top of that, we then see this uh, description right here for uh, other method. So now at this point, we're starting to see uh, two things that are kind of important to us. The first is gonna be the name of the class that we created ourselves, as well as the name of the method that uh, we created inside of that class. And then the next thing we see, all the stuff that we see in parentheses over here, it's going to make another mention of that exact file. So generally speaking, the name of the file will match the name of the class since in the vast majority of cases, you're creating a public class that has to be, uh, that has to have the same name as the file. So that much will match up. And then the very last thing we see right here is gonna be this line number. So this actually shows us on what line in our program that exception was thrown. So in this case, we see line 16. Uh, if you're setting this up in a, uh, an IDE like NetBeans, you might have some additional statements like maybe a, uh, a package statement inside of your program, inside of your Java file. So maybe it won't say line 16. Uh, depending on the amount of spaces that you're using, it might be more like line 17 or 18. Uh, but it'll be in the general area where, uh, where you see this method, whatever line number that pertains to, that's, that's what it's gonna show you there. And then in addition to that, it's also gonna show us the main method. So if we go back in the order, as I mentioned before, the main method always goes onto the stack first, and then it kind of builds on it by pushing more methods onto it from there. You can actually see that uh, ordering right here, the main method being at the very bottom of our stack, and then the other method being on top of it, and then the next int method being the thing that we called, going on top of that. And then from there, it's going to continue to stack on additional methods that are found in the scanner class of the Java API. So then when we get to the very last one, we're gonna see, it talking about the main method. Again, we're gonna see the name of the file and a line number. So if you look on line number seven, right here, this is gonna be where we actually called our other method. So the line number where we called it, that's what it's gonna be showing there. And so if you look at some of these other lines right here, this gives you a pretty good idea about the overall structure of that scanner class, because it actually tells you a little bit about what line number some of these methods are being called from. And that is to say the, the next method up from there. So like uh, this 2076 would mean where the method above it was being called from. The 2117 would be the method up from there and so forth and so on. Okay. So the general idea here when it comes to debugging purposes, so now that you've seen the general structure of the stack trace, uh, what this actually does, it tells you a couple of different things. If you're dealing with multiple files that you constructed yourself, you can now see the name of which class or which file your error or your exception is occurring from. It will also show you the methods where that's occurring from. So you can see the, a more general idea about the structure, the layout of that class where that error is occurring. And then you can also get a very precise piece of information, which is the line number. So generally speaking, when you're dealing with uh, these different kinds of errors or exceptions, this line number does a pretty good job of telling you where it's occurring at. There are going to be some exceptions to this though. So if we come back over here, so let's say that we leave our declaration and initialization alone and say maybe on this next line, I go ahead and just put in the name user input and let's say that I forget to include the semicolon at the end, or I just kind of forget to do any kind of assignment with this. So we'll go ahead and come over here. Let's go ahead and clear this. We'll try to compile it. And so when we try to compile it, it's gonna give us an error, but it's going to show us the error is gonna be talking about at line 17. It's gonna say error, a semicolon was expected, and then it's gonna show this line where it's saying our system that out that print, please enter a number. So we come over here, we see that it's talking about this line when in actuality the real problem that we had was at the line just above it. So in some cases, 
it's not necessarily going to be exactly the line that we're referring to where we're going to see our uh, exception or our error occurring. Uh, so if we're talking about additional types of debugging, say like in a very simple case like this where we have a compile time error, uh, we want to make sure that we are checking not just the line where the error is occurring, but probably we want to get the full context of say a couple of lines above. Uh, that's a, a good place to start. And if that's still not enough, maybe in some cases we can also start taking a look at the lines below it uh, to get a general idea about what it is that we intended for it to do. Okay, so in this particular case, obviously the line that we want to fix is line 15, either by removing this or just doing some kind of assignment. Uh, and line 17 is just kind of a, uh, uh, we'll say collateral damage for uh, where it expected the error to be. Okay, so this is going to wrap up everything that I want to say about the stack trace and a little bit about debugging. Uh, essentially trying to give you this idea about both uh, debugging when we're dealing with exceptions where you see a full stack trace, or in this case with what I just demonstrated, dealing with debugging for any kind of compile time errors where we're not necessarily looking at the stack trace, but instead also just seeing our, um, our uh, console uh, errors that are being displayed either in this terminal if you're doing it this way or maybe in the terminal for your uh, your project like say NetBeans. Okay so going into the next video after this I'm gonna take a look at uh, the opposite side of dealing with exceptions so we've seen what it's like to uh, try to catch exceptions so now I want to talk a little bit more about uh, being able to throw exceptions and in this next video we're going to look at how to create our own custom exception classes to be able to throw our own custom exceptions.